Greetings everyone, Steve Cole here coming back and we're for the second part of our LVAD and TH review and we're going to talk about treatment because what good is all this wonderful medical knowledge if we can't do something with it. So let's talk about treating patients with uh, an LVAD. Well, as I said before, but I'll say it again, the VAD hotline or the TH hotline is absolutely your best resource. Uh, it should be right on the device. And if it's not on the device, it's also you can call the, there's a hotline on the EMS guide you can call as well. Uh, actually, probably the hotline is in several spots and people will know the hotline, they'll give it to you. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, is our goal. And as I said before, it's about perfusion, not about pulses. So let's talk about what improves perfusion. Well, since these patients are often hypotensive uh, and fluid depleted, uh, fluids is a go-to. The other thing is pressors, vasopressors. And there is some evidence, um, re very recent evidence for the medics in here. I just want to take a moment of your time and talk about that um, the dosing for epinephrine in cardiac arrest or suspected cardiac arrest for this is a fraction of the regular dose. And in, in essence, it's a premature push dose presser dose followed by your vasopressor infusion. So your push dose presser of uh, epinephrine followed by an epinephrine or norepinephrine infusion. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's something you need to know. This third thing you're gonna be doing is adjusting settings at the direction of your VAD hotline coordinator. And things like CPR and electricity, uh, electricity if they're in VTAC or VFib, are pretty much your very last result, resort. There isn't a much chance of electricity hurting the device. It's just that you're wasting time when they need other things to restore perfusion and pump function. So let's move on with that. So with those basic concepts in mind, um, remember that bad patients are, you know, they're both unique and they're not. Uh, they're unique in that they have this planned device has some usual unusual considerations but the things that kill them are often things that kill other patients infection blood loss lack of oxygen carrying capacity hypoperfusion so yeah they're special and weird but there's a lot of things that are usually the same as i said chest compressions are usually not indicated when they are indicated they're indicated after you've made sure the pump is not doing its job and that's where that auscultation of the uh, point of maximum impulse, the fourth or fifth intercostal space comes into mind. Basically, take your stethoscope, put it on their chest, listen for the whirly whirls. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is, you know, we're more likely to encounter these patients for some other medical emergency than specific to the VAD itself. So if we're transporting them, make sure the go bag goes with the patient. Make sure the extra batteries are there. Make sure they have everything they need if they get stuck at the ED, separated from their family, especially in this era of COVID and related, related diseases. So again, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Okay, make sure that, make sure you can contact the VAD hotline if you can't access the EMS guide. Um, you'll see that repeat again, because that is the most important thing. Secondly, verify that the pump is on and that's a quick look. See what the leader flow is. Make sure that you have a whirly whirl in the chest. Involve the caregivers. They've had way more training than you have on this. Uh, now, the sad point is that they're calling you is because either A, it's unrelated to the VAD or B, they've exhausted their resources, but involve them and find out what's normal. Uh, vomit care. Now, what is vomit? That's what your vital signs. That's your oxygen. That's your monitor. That's your IV. Uh, for fluid resuscitation and transport is usually indicated. Uh, now understand that vital signs are impacted, uh, such as blood pressure, but you can still, you can still um, get a SpO2, you might be able to get a MAP and those are crucial. And I said before, hypovolemia is the most common complication, so fluid resuscitation is one of your most common interventions. Now what does fluid resuscitation look for these patients? So that's, that's a great question. Uh, these patients tend to be fluid restricted. Uh, if you treat them like heart failure patients, because they are, even with the VAD, then you probably wouldn't flood them with a thousand cc's. No, I would do short, small aliquots, small boluses, i.e. 250 and assess, 250 and assess. Um, 
and and see how that does. And then if they don't respond, then they push those pressures and your um, infusions. Uh, if I'm if I were to be nailed against the wall, um, I would probably go with norepi over epi. Uh, now, yeah, you're doing push dose epi because we don't have push dose norepi in our system. Some places do. But you're really looking for uh, the peripheral vasoconstriction. You don't want to have a significant impact on the heart. So norepi as a presser infusion is probably your better option. So keep in mind, our focus is increasing preload. Now that's your volume, increasing blood pressure with your push dose epi and your vasopressor infusers. Uh, we want to improve afterload. Uh, that is going to, that, you know, and our target is getting just like normally a map of 65 to 85, and that's where fluids are going to come in there. Uh, we need to assess to see if they're overcoagulated. Uh, that's where, you know, because they're probably going to be on Coumadin and aspirin. And then we are also going to be looking to see if, uh, what their pump speed, if it needs to be adjusted. And your most common adjustment, and again, this will be only at the direction of the OVAD coordinator, will be to speed up the RPMs to get the pump pumping faster to compensate for whatever's going on. Oops. Now we talk about ACLS, uh, airway management is unchanged. Or first of all, again, call the VAD hotline. You will hear me say it again. I'll say it again. Call the VAD hotline. Now, while you're waiting to get them on the line, uh, and we actually had a case a few years ago where they could not get a hold of anybody and it's a big deal. So it's not like, oh, we'll always be able to get a hold of people with a, on the VAT hotline. Uh, we had a case where you didn't. So um, what do you do in the meantime? Where well, airway management is unchanged. If they need a tube or they need an LMA, they need it. Do what you got to do. CPAP, airway, oxygenation, etc. So you can cardiovert or defibrillate if they need it. But if, if you're looking at like, yeah, they're in VFib or VTAC, but they're perfusing well, then they don't need it. Uh, consult the VAD hotline first. Um, if you're going to place the pads, avoid placing them directly over the vice. So basically you're looking for anterior, posterior pl placement. Very important, even if they're having chest pain, uh, if they're having chest pain, if they're having uh, anything like that, we don't give vasodilatory meds. These patients are extremely preload dependent and things like nitro bottom out their preload. And you can actually throw them into uh, syncope and hypotension and arrest uh, by giving nitroglycerin. So I wouldn't give uh, nitro or anything similar without consulting the heart, the VAD hotline. Uh, if they're show, throwing VTAC and stuff, but they're somewhat stable, um, again, connect, contact the VAD coordinator or medical control. In short, if they're perfusing, uh, discretion is a better part of valor. If they're just perfusing, take the conservative route and contact the VAD. We only really do aggressive intervention, interventions when they are so hyper perfused, we, they, they are either in arrest or almost there. If you're going to give, um, antiarrhythmics, your doses aren't changed unless there's other conditions involved. If um, again, CPR is the last resort. So if you hear, hear a whirling sound, the pump's working, C don't do CPR unless the VAD coordinator tells you to. You would only do CPR if you think the pump is not working and you confirm that by looking at the controller and listening for the whirly whirl sound in their chest. Now, as far as your treatment transport decisions, uh, again, call the VAD hotline. They'll know which hospital they have the relationship with. Uh, it'll be one of the major hospitals. You wouldn't take them to a freestanding ED normally. Uh, if they're, even if they're stable, always take the go bag with them. Consider the go bag as their lifeline. Keep in mind that when you're assessing these patients, again, I mentioned it before, but look for the other problems that they may have. Look for the uh, stroke, look for the hypovolemia, look for the risk of infection, look for the head injuries uh, that we're worried about. And did I mention, call the VAD hotline? Okay, with that, we're gonna wrap that up and we're gonna talk a little bit about artificial hearts. And this will be a pretty short little add-on. So uh, we're going to just push on through this. 
Uh, so the artificial heart's been around for quite some time. The, the image you see there is um, from 1969. And uh, the fir this first one's placed, a person lived about two days on it, but subsequently the, the next one was um, a few weeks. And then after that, the, what's interesting is while these serve a similar function, the technology behind them is completely different, completely different. This is a complete heart replacement, not a heart, not a substitute or not a uh, assist device. So in your, in your guide that I keep referencing, the total artificial heart is the freedom driver. That's the only one in the United States right now. And I don't know if there's other ones in the works or not, but this is the total artificial heart. So what makes the artificial heart different? Well, if you look in the image right there, you might have a clue. In, the artificial heart actually replaces the heart itself. So it's almost like it is, could be considered a bipad because it assists both devices. Uh, but basically they remove, I want to say this again, they remove as in they cut out all of the lower part of the heart and most of the upper part of the hearts. The, usually the only thing that's left of the upper part of the heart is enough to attach it to, to anchor it to. So this hard piece of plastic is the new heart. There's no, uh, there's no, there's no anything else left except maybe a little bit of SA node that might, might produce a little bit of rhythm on the, on the heart monitor, but other, but is completely clinically insignificant. Now, why would they get an OVA or T tartar artificial heart? Um, I imagine there's probably several different reasons, including uh, damage to the heart muscle. But uh, when I asked this question of uh, some of the coordinators specifically, they said most of the patients that get these are patients with smaller uh, chest chest space. So uh, they, they don't have enough uh, anatomical space to place an OVAD. Now I say that and I got an image of a 16, 17 year old here who's on a total artificial heart. So I don't know how accurate that is, but that's what I was told. So again, this completely replaces the heart as you can see there um this is the aorta this is the uh this would be the um inferior and superior vena cava and a pulmonary artery and vein and basically there's no heart left here at all the reason why this is important is this hard plastic you can't compress it therefore cpr will never work for this whether it's working for not cpr will not work for this device it's hard as a rock. It does not compress at all. So to, just to drive that point home, here you go. Here they have cut, surgically removed most of the heart. You have just a little bit of the atria left. They uh, plumb in the pulmonary artery and vein. They plumb in the aorta. And then they put some valves there to connect it to. And beam, boom, there you go. Bob's your uncle. This is ex basically... They've taken a, and I don't, I th may be wrong on this, but I believe essentially you could say they've taken a four-chambered heart and made it a two-chambered device. I could be wrong on that. And there's another example of how it fits. See, it takes up much less space than the LVAD. Now, the other major difference is that these drive lines are not power. They're pneumatic, which is mind-boggling. So these, I'm going to go back here these pneumatic lines inflate and deflate inflate and deflate inflate and deflate a diaphragm that has a pumping function so because this is pneumatically driven this actually produces a pulse you can feel a pulse with the total artificial heart that in most LVADs you would not feel so as i said the reasons that people get these are very similar as the reasons people get uh LVADs uh, either bridge therapy or for um, destination therapy. Uh, the rate is, you know, they have compared these compared to um, what if they just try to manage these patients medically and they have well over double the survival. They do much better. And like this gentleman right here, he was uh, 25 years old. I said 16. He's 25. He had a viral cardiomyopathy that devastated his heart. And as a result, and he was very athletically active. And as a result, um, he was placed on a TAH. 
And this is him. He plays basketball, or he played basketball this thing. He's gotten his replacement heart, so he doesn't have one of these. But again, I'm going to ask you to stop and look at this, this cable here. This is not a drive line. This is a pair of pneumatic lines. Do not cut these. Uh, they're very hard to repair. Pneumatic lines. So let's compare compare uh, compare VADs versus Toro Official Hearts. So a VAD usually does not have a pulse. You assess it by listening for the whirly whirl sounds. Um, the Total Artificial Heart, because it has those pneumatically driven pumps, is pulsatile. It has a pulse. With the VAD, uh, because there's heart tissue left, you can have an EKG rhythm. With the Total Artificial Heart, there is so little uh, heart muscle left, they'll look either asystolic or they might have like maybe some P waves. For the VAD, absolutely no nitro without special order because they're preload dependent. Because the total artificial heart um, is has completely replaced the heart, is no longer preload dependent. So you can give nitroglycerin. I mean, it is a little preload dependent. Um, you give nitroglycerin at a broader range. With the VAD, because there's heart muscle left, you can cardiovert them. You can do CPR. Because there's no heart muscle left, there's nothing to cardiovert. So no cardioversion, no defibrillation, which that'd be a systole, so you shouldn't be doing it anyway. And because it's just a hard piece of plastic, no blood pressure or no CPR. With a VAD, because it's a continuous flow, you only get a map. With a total artificial heart, because it's driven, it has a pulse. It mimics that. They will, um, you can get a normal blood pressure. With a VAD, they'll often have an ICD pacemaker because there's no longer any heart tissue. Uh, if the ICD pacemaker is in there, it's uh, disconnected, but they usually take those out too. So you should, you know, because these have a pulse style waveform, you should be able to hear a lub dub. You should get a pleth. Uh, but again, you're looking for hypoperfusion and hypoxia uh, more than anything. Um, and again, their risks are the same. Bleeding, trauma, they're on blood thinners, so they have those risks. And again, your treatment is the same. Call the TH hotline. Verify that the pump is on. If you can't find a, the hotline, it, they should have the labels on there, but if you can't get contact, it's also in the EMS guide. Everything else is the same. Again, hypovolemia is our most common complication. ACLS. Um, again, don't administer anything that dilates the myocardium or the vasculature without talking to, uh, the, t the hotline. Since there's no heart, there's no antiarrhythmics to be done because there's no, no effect to be gained. And just like with LVAD, take the go bag with you, um, and transform to one of the major medical centers. And again, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, call the VAD hotline. And that pretty much takes us to the end. I want to thank you for your time. I hope this was useful. And go out there and do good things. And take time to review the artificial, um, the guide, the field guide. Thank you.